I have to say thanks for getting invited out here. Um, probably you don't know me, but I feel like that I'm talking to friends. And even when I listen sometimes to my own CV, I think like I might be really a stranger, you know. I've been grown up as an, as an uh, Austrian expressionist, you know. Then I turned into a kind of Dutch empiricist or rationalist, you know. Then probably uh, American friends, you know, introduced me to materialism and then I might end up as a formalist, you know. But actually, I have to honestly uh, tell you, the only thing that always hold all these things together were actually American critics and theorists and of course, uh, one of them you have in the house, and I think I owe him a lot of my work. Okay, what I'm going to talk today is about the city as an aggregated object. Now, um, what I thought is, because I'm, you might not have known me, uh, but through the introduction of Christie, I want to show you actually how this uh, project evolved. Uh, it didn't just came uh, from nowhere. There was a period of time where I realized uh, the way how I look to the city, you know, from an architectural uh, perspective has radically changed. And what I'm going to present to you today is that shift that happened to me in my curriculum. And you will see it ha had, of course, something to do with a lot of uh, circumstances. But in order to understand my position, um, I'm going to show you at least one work uh, to which most of the uh, things I've done before 2010 was related to, which basically looked at the city as a process of urbanization. Um, and in that sense, um, what I want to dwell on there, that um, topics emerged within this period that basically later on dealt uh, or basically uh, became the source for this little manifesto which I called the city as an aggregated object, which I then show in my second half of the project. Now, what I realized is that the discipline started in the time when I uh, entered, became really an awkward position of the question, what is the city today? And why is that? Because architects seemed like, as they could behave as sociologists, economists, or as any kind of foreigner in the field of architecture, but not understanding that probably the source of urbanization was a link of both of them. And so what I did is I looked uh, back to the work of Siadar, who basically was the first one um, who started to deal with this idea of urbanization. And the interesting thing of him is it was not only that he started to come up with a grid and an architectural figure, like for example that block and its subdivision in order to orchestrate the expansion of the city, but what he also did is he basically defined the regimes that operate on that. And that's what he called the technical, the legislative, the administrative, economic, and political. So the interesting thing is that in the beginning of urbanization, the things were never divided. It was clear that the morphology of the city as a form immediately had a direct impact to all these spaces. And so he was the first one who came up with a parametric model, you know, of how he would identify the relationships of the figure of the block. He was the first who started to analyze uh, compositional matter on the uh, basis of administrative uh, figures and how they could relate in relationship to uh, social political entities like, for example, health and so on. He then started uh, to, uh, I would say, uh, establish a new discipline, which I think was called the subdivision of the ground. He started to realize that the, in order to orchestrate this city mass, how do we geometricize the ground in order to establish that? And he then looked into the economics of that time, and this is, for example, a project in the time when he did his Seattle project, that actually there is a topology embedded from which all that occurred. And so, in principle, he, and here is, I think, one of the first uh, maps where he looked in how uh, legal transformations of former properties to other properties this formed the ground as the establishment for all kinds of urbanized processes. So in that manner, that there was never a distinction between urbanization as a, uh, as a, a formal discipline and urbanization as a political, administrative, technical, and legislative instrument, I started to do a research, and I'll show you one project, which uh, I've done in five cities. And one of them, what I showed you, which I think is the, not the one that uh, should educate you, but educate me, 
uh, was basically this uh, recovery I did in the United States. It was a project in Phoenix. Now, when I came to Phoenix with a bunch of Koreans uh, that uh, I sort of always collected Asians around me, uh, uh, well, you know, Europe has changed. Um, uh, we suddenly end out, uh, uh, entered into this field, and uh, what was interesting, I met for that research project a farmer. He was living here on 157th Street. Yeah, I'll never forget him, called Michael Moore. And uh, Nana Ellen, you know, I think a, a real, real planner, you know, uh, she basically introduced me to him, and he said, oh, you're interested in uh, urbanization? No problem, come with me. So he took me, you know, oh, first. Before he took me, he showed me this map. Uh, this was a broker's map of his family, yeah, and because his family wanted to sell the ground uh, and the piece of land because it became very expensive. And what was interesting, I couldn't believe that, that broker map showed that in the middle of the desert here, you know, you would plan cities of around 40 square miles, yeah. So uh, what became interesting is suddenly that there was not any more an idea that the city can grow in terms of an orchestrate manner. No, the city grows per project. And this was one of the most gigantic things I've ever met. So when we moved out there in the desert, suddenly in the middle of nowhere, I saw this board and it said, here will come 82,000 residential units, commercial business park, mixed use, open space, you know, between uh, four, four um, um, square miles in one direction and 10 in the other. So I became interested and asked myself, how can I actually do a research on that? And so, of course, the question was not how can I resemble that layout. The question was more what, what uh, processes actually inform its it shapes. And so, of course, the first one uh, that you might know much better than me uh, is, of course, uh, Levit, who introduced more or less that you could produce neighborhood as one project of uh, manufacturing. But what I became interested in that suddenly that I got the, uh, that I think it was uh, uh, Keller Easterling in one of her articles, she, she showed me uh, or she hinted to me to this paper that I haven't seen ever before. And it was a paper on, um, uh, uh, on a conference of home ownership in 1928, which basically I became interested in the first book, which was what we just called planning on a residential districts. And what was interesting is that there was an idea uh, how you can take a model of uh, programmatic diversity within a frame of the, um, uh, I think it was roughly a quarter mile. And so what the, uh, Harvard get, uh, got as a research to study how basically this model could start to turn as a model of urbanization. So here, um, a study that I later found, which is a set of research into infrastructural mode of access to one house. You can see it, it's called single, single building lane, which means one infrastructure to one house. And how then the diagram articulates it in, the, in a critium pattern, or you see it in a kind of uh, irregular pattern, or the uh, double infrastructure lane and how it accumulated into a kind of um, irregular pattern, or the triple lane. Then the, the coulis sac, you know, how that uh, mode of accessibility structures these models. And what became interesting, they became more or less mapped out, financially orchestrated to see what kind of money influences is each time put into each of these suburbs. And it became then uh, uh, a layout in which all the infrastructures that basically were, uh, were necessary to use in order to build this up became uh, 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 managed. It even went into housing. And in the end, it all was necessary in order to calculate what kind of money input uh, uh, can be possible. And so it turned out that uh, $6.25 is the investment of a square foot necessary in order to reconstruct it. Now what is interesting in the book I figured out is that there was never an idea of um, a kind of suburban homogeneous idea, but what was actually always interesting is how do you introduce a kind of diversity um, of uh, different typologies, and here it was called uh, neighborhood of varied buildings, actually uh, lay out in such a manner. Now, uh, what followed, which I found later on, is 
that this turned into a kind of regulation in the United States of planning affordable neighborhoods. And so basically the idea became how do you homogenize the grid into equal potential fields in order for each time have the same investment uh, to orchestrate. And so there was bad examples, good examples, bad. And so the geome geometric layout of how subdivision uh, tries to unify the elements in order to have equally the same field uh, uh, made it possible that they had suddenly to reinvent this kind of geometrical layout. Here you can see some other forms. Now, of course, this, was, this is probably only possible if you erase the ground. Now, of course, there are a lot of things said here uh, in the recent debate uh, that uh, urban design and parametric is only a question of phenomenology. But what I became interested in is not in the ground as a kind of um, phenomena in the sense of its experience, but the question is how is the ground to be understood as an economical matter. Uh, this is my uncle's backyard. He was a hippie. He was a hippie. He's living in Tucson, Arizona, and this was his backyard. So basically when I, I came there, um, I said, well, this is not the way I want to look at. What I want to look at is into hedonic price models. I became interested in hedonic price models. How does, how does the real estate calculate land, and how does it feature every land in order to become a value? And so what I started to do is, instead of, uh, I looked into the topographies, you know, I looked into the uh, land formations, we looked into the kind of ecologies of the land and into the kind of uh, biodiversity and saw how on a piece of things, because it was clear that it's impossible that we ever can make here a project. Yeah? How can we make a study as a cutout of this piece? And so what we did is we took a piece of land, similar to a quarter mile, and then uh, looked what the kind of land value or the territory as a matter would explore. We looked also in some uh, uh, radiation patterns, you know, in the way how the ecology starts to operate as this field. Then we looked into a closer uh, looking to the currency of the housing market, and it was very fascinating to see what kind of diversity of market actually there is from $50,000 houses to 1.5 million. And then we looked closer to the construction of each of the houses, and what was fascinating, you know, for an Austrian who only knows brick walls, you know, uh, I became interested that how can you deal with environmental constraints if there's no mass. So we looked into the geometry of the buildings and how we can ventilate them. And basically what we did is we transformed the kind of house into an envelope with a hole. Yeah, and so we established a kind of little uh, uh, prototype of an envelope house that in principle uh, behaves as it can take any kind of uh, different kind of programs with itself. And so, and now, uh, due to uh, Patrick, uh, who of course gave this whole thing a parametric thesis, I always became interested more into the associativity of these uh, uh, operations and how one links to the other. So here then, um, we formulate a kind of population of units or envelopes, and these units and envelopes then became part of the territory. And so uh, what we established is a kind of an idea of a, uh, a suburban um, entity in which the question is not, was not so much how does it fulfill any kind of uh, deliveries of urban growth, but how does it fulfill a kind of diversity in stake within the territory. So millions of these envelopes can either take other programs um, uh, uh, like shopping or other programs in housing. And of course, if you look at it closer, it had um, respondents to the, the Redburn project uh, in the 20s, where in principle the wilderness became basically the ground for all these little features in the territory. So the idea to show you this project was because it was an establishment of trying to understand something which I summarized and was called uh, the idea of biopolitics and urbanization. I think it's not me who wrote about this. I think uh, Sven Wallenstein basically defined it much better. But what was the idea by looking into Serda was that with Serda's idea of regulating the way how we live, uh, the strategy that uh, Foucault once put forward in his security and territory in which the human species became the object of political strategy, that's why I think urbanization was at stake. But of course, um, what happened, and this happened to me, to other colleagues, I suddenly realized that in 2009 or 10, this project might be obsolete. And it had 
two things. First of all, things like this emerged. Yeah? A gigantic uh, uh, project like the one headquarter of, uh, of Norman Foster for Apple. And of course the idea was that this is not just a building, it is a city in itself. The second thing was happening in that time that uh, Patrick Schumacher wrote the uh, Auto Basis of, uh, of Architecture, which I think gave a theory, or basically the basis of the theory of what my work in, until that time was dwelling on. And at the same time, a kind of ontology emerged, an ontology that asked itself, how can we look to cities, probably not from undermining or overmining them, but how can we look at them as real things? So in that time, what I thought is, um, how can I engage in the city from a different manner and look at it, what it might be, and what forms it has over the history. And so, as you can see, it was clear, if you just look to the, to just to the size of it, you know, it was clear that this thing here, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, what matters is probably a totally different form of investment, and the mega form as that model of uh, urbanization occurred throughout the 20th century, and I became interested in to look at it closer. So what I did is I made a little history in asking myself, when did we look actually to the city? How did we look at it? And I, and, and I took Graham Harman's idea by once looking and saying, what, why, when did we actually undermine the city as an object? And I think I realized that many of my work that I've done was dwelling on, uh, I think, uh, a thesis that be, definitely had been forward 20 years ago uh, by Sanford and, of course, others, which basically argued that what you see, and he showed these three paintings of Borgioni, that what you see is not a painting or a representation of something. What you see is basically three stages of matter. And so when he looked at this, when he looked at the image, he showed actually that the first image, the uh, farewell, is actually what he painted here, is a gas, gasoline uh, uh, stage of, of matter. And what you see here, uh, those who go, it's kind of liquid stage. And what the interesting thing became is it doesn't look at the, at the object what it is. It looks at the microscopic uh, model that explains the whole. And, of course, the last one was, you know, those who stay, meaning a solidified state of matter. Now, the same thing occurred, of course, with modernism. And if you look uh, closer to the book of Le Corbusier, then you might see that what he really understands is what it makes the city is actually its flows. Uh, he became very interesting in the way how uh, the infrastructural mode orchestrated the city uh, underneath. He even took a biological relationship to that in saying that what constructs the city is actually an agglomeration between the living unit as a cell to its larger organism. And I think a very interesting uh, model that I found uh, from the settlement of Frankfurt is that what is underlying between a figure ground diagram of slabs is basically the production mode of Fortism that orchestrates that kind of uh, uh, models. But on the other hand side, we also look to cities where I think we overmined them, which means we didn't look at them as what they are, but we looked at them as what we thought we can make an interpretation of them. Of course, one is uh, uh, towards a phenomenology of architecture, and I think what became clear is that what you see as a city is not that what a city is in its uh, figurative organization. What it is is that, that there is a phenomena taken care of before of a place, let's say, for example, the locus of the location, or I think he writes it very nicely in the, in the third chapter about Rome, that Rome is not Rome. Rome is basically a representation of the territory outside Rome with its enormously figurative void spaces uh, casted through the landscape. And of course, uh, an overbinding position is the city of, of Aldo Rossi. Now, it was clear when Aldo Rossi came uh, with the, his thesis, what he wanted to instrumentalize is that within one building, you know, there is an embeddedness of its history as an artifact. And so the artifact in itself incorporates in itself the idea of the city. And as an effect of that, the question was not anymore um, what you design is that um, what might be affected to, the, to today, but what you design is what is common throughout the history of knowledge, let's for example the courtyard, or it's pure abstraction. And so the thesis ended that the city is basically an analogy of that stories of objects that never existed in real time, but all are part within the same history. 
And of course, I would argue that the closest of my readings, but still I would say it has an overmining position, is of course uh, the Collar City, which I owe of, uh, a lot of uh, ideas from, but which I think wants to dwell uh, on, a, on a deeper level than what I consider. And that is that it, it reduces all the dynamics that are the city to the form of the figure in the ground. And of course, we all know on the one hand side, the Nolli plan and of course the Piranesi plan as the two models between the pre-modern and the modern diagram. And I show you uh, this fantastic model, which I think was in an exhibition, uh, which shows the first time that figurative element. But what I would argue is that even when it describes the most realistically the form, it tries to dwell on a metathesis of the city. And I think uh, I just realized uh, recently in an interview uh, that Greg Lane did together with uh, Peter Eisenman, where basically he started to say the interesting thing was, how do you make void to a positive and negative and figure and positive and negative and overcome the homogeneity or what they call the over metaphysic of space. So in having said that, my idea was in looking at the city as an object and what I meant by that, I wanted to look at it as what it is as a whole. And I defined three uh, of these objects which I am going to propose you a kind of a fifth one and as you can see the subtitle was the fifth city. The first city um, I think is the city of the circle. Now the interesting thing of the city of the circle is not only that it's defined by boundary, uh, it has not clear dis uh, distinction between what is owned in terms of property and what is uh, not owned. But what is interesting is that its morphologic, uh, morphological understanding of the city is that it has basically a, a diagram in which every house is next to the other house and forming through a grid, and this is a, a grid structure, a hole whereby larger entities are carved out. Now the city of the circle of course got its most uh, uh, reputation I think throughout the Middle Age where basically within the boundary of that city defined its interior uh, uh, due to the idea that um, whenever the city grew, it grew basically by extending that boundary. But what was interesting in, that, in the city of the circle is there was no ownership to land. What was interesting is you owned the house, but you didn't own the land. And, I, and you will see what I mean by this. Because with the city of the grid, and this is the city of, uh, of urbanization, what started to happen is not only that it's a city which we know from um, colonization and Manhattan grid, but what the first time was happened with the grid is you started to subdivide land in order to own land. And so what happened in the shift between the city of the circle to the city of the grid you not only, uh, the, the owning the land meant it became a property of exploring the city by subdividing that land. And of course this is then uh, going through to the, to, uh, to the thesis of, uh, of urbanization by, um, by Zerdar. And with the shift of owning the land, in the beginning of the 20th century, I would argue a new city emerged, the city of the archipelagos. What I meant by them, it became a shift in the economical investment money of, of the city. And so what happened is, in here it's a project of, it especially happened in Frankfurt, in Vienna, and in the Netherlands, where public money, larger public money, bought large pieces of land yeah, in order to lay out a kind of field of slabs. And what you can see the first time is you didn't, the, the land was owned by a large institution and the house that you uh, took was not anymore your own, the house you took was on a, on a rent. So the person that owned the land was not the person who owned basically uh, the house. And as you can see, what I meant by the first archipelago is that this project was not anymore the idea the city is a whole or the city expands as a grid. No, it became a confetti of projects throughout uh, the territory, which you can see here in red. Now, that idea of the Siedlung, how it was called in German, of course you can see then in Milan's other projects within Europe, for example, in the Plan Voisin in from, from Le Corbusier, and you can see it as a post-war uh, um, post uh, reconstruction of the cities, um, which uh, of the welfare state, which of course, uh, for example, can be indicated by houses like Candilis Woods uh, or by Aldo Rossi's, where in principle the idea was each time the same, 
the investment was done to a larger piece of land in which each of the buildings were owned and ran then to the people that inhabit them. And the diagram for that kind of welfare state city became later on the diagram of uh, Ungas, in which there was an argument that what constructed the city is basically the city within the city and its archipelagos. And I, but with the city of archipelago, I would argue that in the second stage of the 20th century, a city as a solid emerged. And I think it's a, an American uh, idea, and especially because it got its thesis by Andrea Branze with the nonstop city, where basically he took uh, three phenomena, let's say the car park, the shopping mall, uh, and the hotel, and merged it into one container. And it became suddenly a purely interior. Uh, what became interesting is suddenly there was no relationship to the ground. The ground became reestablished as here as an artificial land on the roof, but it became an entity that basically had a relationship to its existing uh, uh, um, idea, but it didn't have any more something that was extruded from its immediate territory. Uh, you can see that, in a, of course, in projects like Holine, who would take just object, put it in the landscape, yeah, and its form by itself turns it into a pure statement of urban design. Or where he basically would come up with mega forms uh, elevated uh, over Vienna, or real mega forms, as you can see here, one by Moneo in the Diagonal in Barcelona, which basically started to ignore the territory that is underneath, and it's, for example, like in this case, it just expanded over three or four of the blocks, independently what the economics of the ground have been. And so, of course, his thesis became for OMA and for the project uh, of the welfare state hotel, for example, Ram Kulas or the Sphinx Hotel, where the idea was that we, the building itself becomes the city. And so the first time, the city was not more any question of a confetti of settlements. The architectural object became the city itself. And um, I think the, the image that basically articulates that the most uh, is the city of the captive globe, where you can really see that any kind of city only relates to that particular block that can relate to the ground of the Manhattan grid. Now, having said that, I, I want to show you an interesting reading of that. I would argue that between the city of the circle and the city of the grid, the diagram of the left side, as once described by Emil Kaufmann, was at stake. Architecture's role was to basically uh, lose its identity in order to sacrifice its identity to serve the whole. And that means it was, as you can see with the Nolly plan, it was just an anonymous mass in which the public spaces were carved out. But then what uh, Kaufman writes on the work of Ledoux, that what happened in the 18th century, and that I would argue is, this, is what is called today the modern diagram, where the individual building gets rid of uh, its neighboring building, where it starts to isolate, two interesting things happen. One is it's the shift from uh, not owning the land to starting to own the land, and what happens now is that a new uh, disciplinary problem emerged and that I would argue is suddenly how does the object hit the ground which I uh, owe a lot of the insights of Jeff and of course in the way how to read that. And so by isolating the, uh, the, the building, the architectural object from its context, what happens is a new set of diagram emerged because the question was how does now a single building stand on the ground and I think you know these diagrams nearly better than me. But why the first one is distinct, distinctive from the rest is the first one, as Palladio says, is still is reestablishing the ground as land. But I think what is interesting between from Ledoux to Miss van der Rohe, it was really about how does a public space emerge? How does something emerge underneath the building? And I would argue it, it has to do because there became a new idea, understanding that land was not owned, was suddenly become owned by someone. And not anymore before, as in the Middle Age, you only rented land, but you owned the house. And of course, this diagram moved then into the post-war, uh, uh, post-period, where suddenly a renegotiation of that modernist uh, diagram emerged, where, for example, Saha would say, since 
the modernist forgot to re-establish a relationship with the land because it li wanted to lift it up. How do you re-engage re with the public? And I would say that these four projects are renegotiations with the public through architecture, the Kobhimabal diagram with the cantilever and the public space underneath, uh, the Kohlhaas diagram which brings the ground into the building, then the tilt the ground by Peter Eisenman, which I have to honestly say, uh, not completely access, but I, I find it an interesting figurative, void figurative diagram, but, but I don't access the metaphysical space. And of course, Saha's idea, where the, build, where the object, the building itself, comes dissolved. Now, this said, I think I've, Holland brought it to the point already in the 50s. And what Holland showed in this diagram, he not only showed that uh, the kind of chronology of how an object has lifted off the ground. I think he precast it with the last diagram, already uh, um, a kind of whole range of uh, post-modern uh, uh, ideas in which he argues that the building itself becomes the ground of uh, uh, the project. And in having said that, my idea of all these diagrams is to bring forward or to have the sensibility that a new diagram emerges in today's urban context, and I would argue is that the city as the aggregated figure with multiple grounds. What I, what I want to argue is that there might not be a city that reestablishes itself to the territory. There might be a city that establishes itself through the building that constitutes the relationship to the next building to come. Now, why I want to say that is because my reading of modernist architecture in relation to the city is not only one that how a project <laughs> is related uh, to its territory, but uh, I want to, uh, my idea is that it probably uh, is a project that relates only to itself. And so I made this little uh, manifesto, which is called the fifth city uh, for the Venice Biennale last year. And it was the first time where I tried to approach the idea of the fifth city. Here's a diagram of Maripur. You can see it, it was, uh, here you would be the middle aged Maribor with the circle. Here you would see the grid, the, ex the urban expansion in the 19th century and the confettis. And here's basically that idea of the, of the fifth city. Now the idea of the fifth city is that basically the figure, the building, becomes figure and ground at the same time. So what you can see here is why it is not only the ground of the territory, it's basically the part of the building that provides for the next building uh, to come. And so, the idea is that basically the city is orchestrated only within itself. And here are some examples of um, uh, this project that was recently presented. And here in a kind of uh, figure ground diagram, uh, um, I wanted to show how that relates that all these other four um, uh, ideas here you could say, for example, the large-scale solids, yeah? and here, for example, the middle age, that, so, that there is an idea of the city that probably only works as the aggregation of architecture. Now, so that means what I wanted to add to these diagrams is this little third diagram, and which I would argue that architecture in the third diagram is not anymore itself. It's also not anymore part of a whole. What it is is it only defines its relationship to an unpredicted whole whereby every part itself is distinct readable. And so my idea of the city is that we don't know anymore today what the whole might be, but what we know is how one object relates to the other. And this uh, started a kind of uh, trajectory of research where the question was not anymore how do I find the relationship between a building and its territory, the question was what in a building can be potentially ground of the next building? And so what I looked in, into a series of 20th century buildings, and suddenly to figure out, has there not been an idea within modernism that argued that there is urban space or potential urban ground within uh, uh, buildings itself? And so this is a kind of catalog of, my, of what I've researched. For example, one, uh, a classic, of course, is a uh, uh, the Ville Immobilier by Le Corbusier, where a um, uh, response to the garden city has a gigantic void space on which he agglomerates all the little elements. But in that sense, it was still traditionally a land. But of course, in Le Corbusier's case, you understand, uh, suddenly you realize the reestablishment of the roof, uh, 
as the potential collective ground, or in, Lake, uh, in Leonidov, that a floor, a, a kind of floor slab, becomes the collective entity. Of course, a, um, an example that, that definitely is the precast for a lot of these ideas of multiple grounds is Hilversheimer's vertical city, where basically one program establishes another program by each program becoming the ground for the next program. Then um, 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 the whole idea of uh, uh, unité habitation with the street, the, the, the corridor that goes for the building, re-established later on by Ellison and Peter Smith, that argued basically that the corridor becomes an urban element. And uh, looking it further to the Sphinx Hotel, where basically the terracing started to become part of it, the idea of this uh, little diagram was to start to uh, understand how one object, uh, one part of a building, could turn into the potential relationship for the next building. And so, to only show you some figures that I think uh, already happened, that not only that the building becomes ground for building, is of course uh, this, uh, the, um, the Rockefeller Center with the gardens and the bridges starting over to take a new landscape. Of course, the, the primary idea of the high-rise as an as a theorem of the reestablishing of lands above each other where the floor becomes the ground for the next floor. And this has, of course, turned into projects like uh, Rams Ilgesu Library. But another thing be I became interesting that, for example, in Aldo Rossi's cemetery in Modena, the facade of the building itself frames suddenly a ground for a territory where you suddenly have a container which is completely empty and only the facade as an architectural element does the ground. And so, having said that, a kind of project started to happen where I wanted to give an image of this uh, city as an aggregated figure, where I looked each time uh, in different architectural elements and how these elements could start to form an aggregation of a city. The first project is uh, something I did in Barcelona with, uh, uh, with, uh, in the sci-fi research program, which was the idea to bring up the first time a kind of object nest of that city um, uh, in relationship to an existing city like Barcelona. So what I looked at in, or what we looked together, is that how we took different elements of the architecture building and considered it as ground, and how does that unfold into then an object. For example, here uh, we looked into the floors as ground and how they established then a kind of territory as a building. Uh, uh, trying to test these models um, in a sectional manner and figure it out how that could work. And then bring it back into the context because each of the buildings basically have been a direct uh, extraction of the context. Another project was uh, that looked into the, the elevator shaft as a potential uh, element that can produce uh, uh, the network of such a city. So here you can see how the elevator shaft turns from a, a street to a corridor to a, to a diagonal to an elevator and ma makes a mesh of basically an autonomous uh, city. Uh, then uh, th this was a project that took uh, the Barcelonian block, uh, looked closely into the way how it is set it, and looked into the in individual staircases and into the roof and how can that take as a use um, the way how you could aggregate this thing towards a building. Here you can see a kind of vertical void space that emerged out of this uh, aggregation. And one uh, was a, a little bit a, uh, a project that looked uh, how can a building uh, become a road so it basically took the corridors of each building and turned it into a three-dimensional uh, grid. Uh, and so it became a kind of a gigantic volume of buildings uh, within that environment. Uh, the last thing what I did, or it started to happen uh, two months ago, which was a, a project in Los Angeles that I did uh, within my institute, which turned an interesting point to that question because as more as I started to become interested in the single entity for defining a city, I suddenly came across an article that actually Hernandez Alonso uh, made me clear, 
that uh, in the competition of today's urban environment, if cities don't have gigantic town towns, they cannot compete more or less within a global city. So there was an idea to take Los, uh, Los Angeles as a low-rise uh, downtown and see how we can orchestrate that idea of the city as an aggregated figure um, by playing off to look at the high-riser as the understanding of the high-riser not as an extrusion of a vertical uh, land, but basically understand the high-riser as being many buildings within one, whereby once the lobby, once the floors, and once basically its structural entity could become part of the city as well as the land. And so, for example, this was a project that looked into the, uh, the, the tower as a part of the whole relationship of each time producing lobbies that could, trans that could be part of being a ground for such a city. And so here, uh, it was built, uh, there were like buildings of around four million square meters uh, of, of uh, sort of taking on nine blocks in uh, LA and basically uh, making um, a suggestion of such a city. And in that time, uh, it was really the idea of how you basically can access uh, this thing. And they were basically all uh, drawings that related to the section because the section was probably the only thing how I could show or how we could show the relationship between a building uh, and its land. And here you see some of this uh, test. This was a one project that looked into floors and how could floors make basically uh, a city. Um, it uh, took actually the tower and sort of um, uh, um, uh, took the tower onto itself in order to make, a three, uh, make the floor as a continuous uh, property of land. And here you can see uh, one of these sections, how it worked out. And the last project that basically has a lot to do with the kind of workshop we did was really dwelling on also on the idea of the Sears Tower. In that sense, uh, the Sears Tower was here understood really as something that becomes not figure as, an, as a modernist extrusion, neither to become land formation in the case of uh, the project of uh, Greg Lynn, but how basically the building and the land in its structural entity forms to become one building in itself. And here you can see some of the appealing what a structure becomes part of the territory, but still is part of its uh, whole. And so this became then a kind of uh, suggestion of that. And here a section. Now, of course, uh, when Ram Kohlhaus once wrote uh, uh, his uh, Delirious New York, he said, there is a city with all evidence, but uh, no manifesto. Um, I realized I had an idea, but I had no evidence. So recently, uh, recently I thought um, I have to look. Um, and so I came across um, this little thing here. It's a, a Chinese uh, villa on an existing high rise where basically um, someone built a mountain uh, above uh, a 26 story high uh, uh, house. And um, it's only complained now, the people below, because they own the house, complain that something might happen. S something similar happens also in China. Uh, these are office buildings on the roof for, for a shopping mall yeah, where in principle uh, the, sh the, the roof as a shopping mall is really used not only as putting something on it, but really used as a new tatum that can be orchestrated with boundaries, properties, grass, functional distribution. But the most interesting thing I came across is this little, this little uh, housing unit where basically on the roof you have really roads that established basically a city above the city on this land. Now, I know that this might be China, and I know the interesting thing is that these are all happening in economical zones that of course have strange forms of exceptions because within that zones, new territories of ownership and things might occur. But I became interested more or less that probably 
that we all, that there, of course it has a different connotation, but I, I found it very interesting that Foster has built this tower within an existing building in Manhattan. And what is interesting when you look at this tower that is within the existing building that has been there, it redeforms really the, the elements of the tower. The, the entrance of the tower is not anymore the entrance. What is the entrance of the tower is a hole within the bottom of the tower, as well as at the same time, the building turns into a lobby of itself. So my, argu my argument is that the aggregated city is not only just a manifesto, it's something we might build on. And the, the reason for that is that uh, in Europe, there is no such thing that once uh, Alan Colophon said that the city is constructed by just big amounts of investment. It doesn't matter if this investment is from a state or from an ownership. But what happens now is that not only uh, socialist common ownership are interesting, but new forms of collective ownership start to happen. And I also see uh, it in a case which goes back to my biopolitical uh, idea, that there is more and more the idea that you might have uh, zones that reestablishes the order of certain kind of laws that we have, let's say like Agamben defines in a stage of exceptions. Not that it's, it's a camp, but what it means is that all these zones we have seen in China are actually zones out of economical relationship. So in that sense, I hope I can not only contribute a kind of idea, but I hope it becomes evidence over the couple of next time. And so thank you. to show you is that all the work that I have done uh, before uh, that idea was trying to argue the city outside the city. You know, I argued it from a justification of its regimes that make its form. Yeah? And so, uh, of course, you, you can have an enormous amount of research in, in, in the economic of how houses, in the way of how a subdivision of land is laid out. But my I, became, I had an urge in myself that I suddenly realized that over the last 20 or 30 years, we might have become enormously well good in making, and I think Patrick Schumacher says it, you know, we, we, uh, to provide a model for free economy, which means we started to know much better how we produce knowledge within the existing city and how we orchestrate it. Um, but you know, uh, throughout my curriculum, I became bounded by, by two uh, borders, you know. On the one hand side, some of my work related, of course, in, in the, directly to, to Patrick Schumacher's uh, work because there is an idea in his case that, what he, that he doesn't believe in, a, in actually a real form. What he believes is in the negotiation of all these systems, yeah. But I'm bounded on the right side of an ex-colleague that believes that the only city to be justifiable is the city of a border, uh, and, you know, that distinguish between in and outside. So my, I wanted to put, I wanted to come up with an idea of the city, yeah, rather than to just read the existing city. And so that was my urge, and that's why I have to put this forward. I'm going to try to reformulate the question. 
and uh, I have to be honest to you, this is very young, you know, I mean, it's work that uh, have a definitely an insecurity, yeah, it's it definitely work that uh, has not the ground. You should not forget, it was very easy to make the first work because there was 150 years of urbanization from which basically you can learn from these regimes and how they activate. I only had to look. But now, what, um, um, of course, there is an interesting thing which happens, and that is if you look, for example, into that, into that uh, diagram or model, you can see that anything that is public there has, of course, a particular space. It has the potential to be either bark, land, uh, theater, stage, platform. The interesting thing of it is it just doesn't want to show that there is no such thing as to believe in that we, that there is something that we, con that we commonly construct the city. I think what that wants to show is that every city is a construction of individual projects, yeah? And each of them produce the quality for the next to come. I think there's... Uh, I, mean, I, I was really asking, yeah. did I ask the question the way, the way you wanted it? Yeah. But, but don't you think that some of the, but don't you think that some of the sections are not thousand times better than non-stop city? I mean, uh, I, well, I mean, what, uh, not that many people would think it was an incredible achievement to be non-stop. Of course, I can tell you that. As a diagram, it's uh, one of my actually love the project. I don't love it as a picture of a city to live in, although I do think it has potential in that regard, exactly. But I love the fact that uh, when you're trying to, I mean, you could have built this model very easily, get everything orthogonal, still have ground dependencies, it would end up looking sort of like the unit thing or something like that. So it would, uh, it would be very easy to normalize this and still maintain the intrinsic diagrammatic relationship. What you lose is the level of structural diagram for this would start to become a homogeneous nonlinear mm -hmm. And that that has a kind of political model behind the United City and a new kind of uh, relationship between no longer individual collective, but small collective, large collective, and the individual as a collective. I, I think it's quite compelling. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I think the lesson is how to do these diagrams. But you know, uh, you know that's why I show the square project up for me, and the and the more funky stuff is made with you. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but you know, um, I think um, you see the square is only because this is really existing buildings. It's not that the the, the city has to be reinvented. I mean, I, let's say I think I agree with many people uh, in the states that you cannot um, uh, invent architecture, you know? I think, but you can invent city in relationship to architecture. And I think that project shows that the buildings, basically volumes are the same, but uh, it would give a re-reading of the city. And what I think is interesting, a re-reading of the architecture as well, because it doesn't have any more a tour, a crowd, yeah? Because you might enter somewhere you don't know. And so there comes a, new politics of the extrusion. And I think that's where uh, I want to show, and I totally agree to you, as you said once to me, you know, only when you fail, you know you're on a good path. And, and so, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I definitely do give you back to your answer. I will try more and more and hard to make little steps in order to not lose the idea quickly. Yeah. You should get Justin to do a finite point analysis of that entire city. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about, it seems you're making an aggregate field that as itself is a part of making the ground. The thing you show, I wonder how it hits the existing ground. I mean, you showed like it with the elevators. 
and maybe in China where the rooftop. So I was kind of curious about how you see this hitting the existing ground instead of just becoming an object within the existing. No, I mean, look, uh, you see, my belief is that there, that. Well, it sounds not strange, you know. Probably, I very kill me. Huh? I don't believe in planning, you know. I, I started to really have a difficulties and started to realize how can I look in the city only through architecture. Huh? And what was interesting is, I looked. I think one of my students came to me with an image from Houston, Texas, and it was the most incredible building I've seen. It was a building that started with a land on one side, yeah and then it swept over and uh, turned it back to the other side. And what became interesting for me is, well, I suddenly recognized in that image, yes, ownership and land, that is what people care, but no one cares about that what is common to all its infrastructure in between. So there is a neglection of the city. And I think that's what Coolhouse has proven with, uh, w when he shows the captive globe. Uh, what makes the city is that that individual worlds that you can extrude out of that. Now, that, that, and, uh, and I think in, in Vienna there was a very interesting example um, which was called, they called it the Platte. You know, it was many, it basically meant uh, making a new ground of which the kind of third city would emerge. And what is interesting is that infrastructure that should carry everything together never existed. Yeah? What happens is everyone does its building and while it's doing its building, it makes the circumstances for, for the next. Yeah? And so basically what this just shows is that within our territory, there are just locations, infrastructure, points on which the thing can access. Yeah? But I see the, the territory just as a pure piece of infrastructure. Thank you.